In Revelation chapter 11, verse 14, John, our author, he leaves his audience with really what can only be described as an ominous warning. Speaking of the death and the resurrection of these two witnesses, the earthquake, the earthquake that demos about a tenth of the city of Jerusalem, the 7,000 souls that perish as a result. John writes, again, Revelation 11, verse 14, the second woe is past. Behold, the third woe is coming quickly. Again, quite an ominous warning. Within the flow of his narrative and the context of what immediately follows, it's clear for us that the third woe in reference will be the sounding of this seventh and final trumpet. Shifting the scene from the streets of Jerusalem, uh, immediately back into the heavenly realm, John records, and we're going to jump back into our text with verse 15 of Revelation 11. He says, Then the seventh angel sounded, and there were loud voices in heaven, saying, The kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of our Lord and of His Christ, and He shall reign forever and ever. And the twenty-four elders who sat before God on their thrones fell on their faces, and they worshipped God, saying, so this is kind of the reaction of heaven, this is their reaction to the sounding of the seventh trumpet. They worship God, and here's their song. We give you thanks, O Lord God Almighty, the one who is and who was and who is to come, because you have taken your great power and reign. The nations were angry, and your wrath has come, and the time of the dead that they should be judged, and that you should reward your servants, the prophets and the saints, and those who fear your name, small and great, and should destroy those who destroy the earth. With the blast of this seventh trumpet, all of heaven here acknowledges the finality of God's plan for the ages, and specifically how this seven-year period of great tribulation will conclude. In an act of His great power, Jesus will return to this earth and He will take possession of the kingdoms of this world and reign, John says, forever and ever. Additionally, in His wrath, Jesus will also judge the world of her wickedness and reward, we're told, His servants, the prophets and the saints. In many ways, verse 18 of Revelation 11, provides for the reader, provides for you and I, a general outline for the remainder of this book. While John hears this seventh trumpet blast, recording the events of heaven, the reaction, we've already noted that Revelation 10, verse 7, confirms that what then results on earth will demand really an unspecified number of days For completion, Uh, looking back, uh, Revelation 10, verse 7, we're told that in the days of the sounding of the seventh angel. So, yes, John sees this heavenly scene, seems quick, seems immediate. He records the reaction, but the way it plays out on earth will be a little different. Just like with the opening of the seventh seal and how it initiated the blowing of these seventh trumpets, we will see in chapters 15 and 16 the sounding of this seventh trumpet that we just read, resulting in seven more what's known as bold judgments being poured out on the world, leading up to the battle of Armageddon and the second coming of Jesus Christ. It's worth pointing out that this is the third time that we have John recording the worship of these 24 elders who sat before God we were introduced to earlier in the book. And in doing so, this being the third time, we find a bit of a progression that, that's interesting. Back in Revelation 4, these 24 elders were told they celebrated God as the creator of heaven and earth. Then in Revelation 5, these 24 fell on their faces, we're told, and they worshiped Jesus, the Lamb who was slain, as their Redeemer. Now, in Revelation 11, we see them praise Jesus again. First it was the Creator, then it was the Redeemer, but this time they celebrate Him as a conquering King and as a judge. I find it noteworthy how they begin their song. Again, in the context of so much judgment, cataclysmic events happening, they begin, we give you thanks. We give you thanks. 
Like, understand the creator of this world not only had a responsibility to provide a way for redemption, but it was absolutely necessary the day would come when he would right every wrong and restore things back to his original design. You see, it's, it's not enough for Jesus and his capacity as Redeemer to provide a way by which men might be saved. You see, as a king and as a judge, it's also necessary that those who commit wickedness, unrepentant sin, face a day of reckoning. Like, never forget that justice demands a fair judgment, a reckoning. Now, you know, I know for some people, and it's true, that the concept of hell, this, this eternal place of, of, of punishment, it ends up being a sticking point when it comes to uh, the God of the Bible, their beliefs concerning God. Many people, just to be fair, struggle with the idea that a God of love could allow such a place like hell to ever exist in the first place. And personally, though, and, and not to be contrarian, but I'd have a greater problem with God if hell didn't exist. You know, you look around at this world, a wicked world, and you wonder, I wonder at least, how in the world could anyone be okay with a God who allows evil to not face a reckoning? To allow the evil deeds of man to go unpunished? I have a bigger problem with that. Now, <laughs> don't get me wrong. I mean, we, we all want God to be loving. And we want Him to be merciful and gracious, right? But you know, I also want God to be just. And I want him to be a defender of the weak. And, and I want to serve a God who's willing to right serious wrongs. Verse 19. John says, Then the temple of God was opened in heaven. And the ark of his covenant was seen in his temple. Now, what results on earth? And there were lightnings, noises, thunderings, and an earthquake and great hail. The imagery is that a big storm is brewing. At this moment, following the blast of the seventh trumpet, as the elders in heaven are worshiping Jesus, John describes something very interesting in this final verse. He says that he saw the temple of God in heaven being opened. And it was the opening of this temple that results in, in the, the early indicators of a storm brewing. Now there are a few things that you should note about this temple in heaven. First, while this is the, the initial first mention of this heavenly temple in the book of Revelation, we do know that the blueprints for the tabernacle and then uh, later the temple in Jerusalem were patterned after the heavenly space, this heavenly temple. So the imagery is completely consistent. You would expect to find uh, what would look like a temple. Secondly, the fact that John says the temple was opened. I mean, we, it took 11 chapters to get to this point. The idea that it was open implies that it had been closed or at least concealed from John's view until this very moment, following the blast of the seventh trumpet. Now, whether this is a location different from the throne room or maybe just a new dimension of the same space that John is now cognitively aware of, we, we really can't say for sure either way. Thirdly, it will become evident why John finds it necessary to introduce us to this place here at the end of chapter 11 because when we get to chapters 14, 15, and 16, this temple will be used as a kind of launching pad by which the final set of cataclysmic judgments are poured out on earth. Now what's really fascinating about this passage and why it, it demands really a few minutes of our consideration is the fact that not only does John see this temple, not only does he see the temple opened, but he saw inside the heavenly temple, he says, the ark of his covenant. You know, all the way back in Exodus, Moses had been given the prints 
for the creation of a piece of furniture known as the Ark of the Covenant. The Ark of the Covenant would be the central piece uh, for the tabernacle, for the worship of God. The Ark would, would be located in the Holy of Holies. It was the place where the Shekinah glory of God would reside. According to the book of Hebrews, we know that the Ark contained inside of this box contained the two tablets of stone, the Ten Commandments. Also had Aaron's budding staff, the, the evidence, the blessing of the priesthood. It also had a jar of the manna that God would send from heaven. Additionally, we also know the Ark of the Covenant would be moved from the tabernacle, which was located in Shiloh, to a permanent home, Solomon's temple. And yet what's really bizarre about the Ark of the Covenant is that at some point in time, the ark itself completely disappears. Like it's no longer mentioned in Scripture, and the archaeological trail goes completely cold. Like we have no, no mention, no record, of the ark of the covenant being taken uh, to Babylon along with the rest of the, the temple treasure. Uh, there's no reference to the ark of the covenant ever existing and the rebuilt second temple, Zerubbabel's temple. Today, theories abound. No one knows where the Ark of the Covenant is. Some say that the Ark was taken before the Babylonian captivity to Ethiopia, where it's today held um, in what's known as St. Mary of Zion Cathedral, guarded by only one person, no one being allowed to see it. Others claim, or at least believe, speculate that the Ark of the Covenant might be hidden in one of the various tunnels under the Temple Mount. In truth, I love the conversations, diving into the archaeology. I love the speculations. I love discussions about the, the location of the Ark of the Covenant. And as much as it pains me to say, the truth is the most likely scenario is that the Ark of the Covenant today possesses no earthly home as it's presently resting in a temple, the temple of God in heaven. And why would this be the case? <laughs> why, why would the Ark of the Covenant be taken right, from earth to heaven? And it's very hard to say with any certainty. But because the Ark was the connecting point between heaven and earth, again, having supernatural power and deep significance it's, it's not difficult to come up with with theories why god would take the ark to heaven uh, maybe he took it to heaven because the jewish people uh, in their temple didn't deserve it that he was illustrating his displeasure i mean maybe the the, the ark was removed uh, from the earth so that it wouldn't fall into the wrong hands maybe because jesus came in the flesh and now the Holy Spirit resides in the hearts of men. The functional purpose of the ark no longer is relevant. Thus it's been taken to heaven. I have no idea. You can uh, study it on your own and come up with your own speculations. Now as we move from chapter 11 to 12, keep in mind that John's revelation of events is again going to be placed on pause. Between the seventh trumpet and the bold judgment, judgments it, it unleashes, John will extend the intermission. And he'll extend the intermission in order to introduce us, his audience, the reader, to a few more characters, characters that are central to this seven-year period of tribulation. In doing this, John will also kind of utilize the opportunity to fill us in on some of the more uh, important events, the other happenings uh, taking place on earth aside from just these judgments. By this point, we have been introduced to some characters. We've been introduced to the 144,000, these Hebrew men sealed, protected by God. We've been introduced last week to these two witnesses representing Jesus in Jerusalem. In chapter 12 now, we will find a reference to five more characters. Uh, we will meet a woman, a dragon, a child, Michael, the archangel, as well as the offspring of the woman. Well, in chapter 11, we, we did have a brief mention uh, of a character known as the beast. In chapter 13, 
we will see the beast rise out of the sea, followed by a second beast who rises out of the land. In these chapters, uh, we will be introduced to seven more characters in total. Now, the initial thing that you should think about with regards to this section of Scripture is that John, he's going to refer to what he's seeing in a very particular way. He's going to refer to what he sees as being signs. Now, the reason that this is noteworthy, something you need to keep in mind as we work our way through this section, is that right from the beginning, John is is telling us that what he records should be viewed not as being literal, but instead as being illustrative. He describes them again as signs. John will use figurative language in his description and depiction of these various characters. And he'll, he'll use figurative language to describe for us kind of the nature of each of these characters. The other thing you need to consider, specifically with regards to chapter 12, which we'll, we're going to look at this morning, is that John will record past events in order to set the stage for future happenings. So what will help you as we work our way through this chapter is to see what he's, he's writing as being illustrative. There are signs. And that he's going to record things that have happened in the past relating to certain characters to set the stage for future happenings. Now, there's a lot of ways that you could approach a chapter like this. Our plan, we're going to read through it in its entirety, the whole chapter. Then we're going to discuss the characters and then by the end, unpack what future scenario John is describing for us. So let's start it. Revelation 12, beginning with verse 1. Again, we're going to read through the whole chapter. John says, Now a great sign, again a sign, appeared in heaven. A woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, and on her head a garland of twelve stars. Then being with child, she cried, cried out in labor, and in pain to give birth. And another sign appeared in heaven. Behold, a great fiery red dragon, having seven heads and ten horns and seven diadems, or gems, on his heads. His tail drew a third of the stars of heaven and threw them to the earth, and the dragon stood before the woman who was ready to give birth to devour her child as soon as it was born. Verse 5. Well, she bore a male child, who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron. And her child was caught up to God in his throne. Then the woman fled into the wilderness, where she has a place prepared by God, that they should feed her there 1,260 days. Verse 7. And war broke out in heaven. Michael and his angels fought with the dragon. And the dragon and his angels fought. But they did not prevail, nor was a place found for them in heaven any longer. So the great dragon was cast out. That serpent of old, called the devil and Satan, who deceives the whole world, he was cast to the earth. And his angels were cast out with him. Verse 10. Then I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ have come. For the accuser of our brethren who accused them before our God day and night has been cast down. And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. And they did not love their lives to the death. Therefore rejoice, O heavens, and you who dwell in them. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and the sea. For the devil has come down to you having great wrath. Because he knows that, his, that he has a short time. Verse 13. Now when the dragon saw that he had been cast to the earth, he persecuted the woman and gave, who gave birth to the male child. But the woman was given two wings of a gray eagle, that she might fly into the wilderness to her place, where she is nourished for a time and times and half a time, three and a half years, from the presence of the serpent. So the serpent spewed water out of his mouth like a flood after the woman, that he might cause her to be carried away by the flood. But the earth helped the woman, and the earth opened its mouth and swallowed up the flood which the dragon had spewed out of his mouth. And the dragon was enraged with the woman, and he went to make war with the rest of her offspring, who keep the commandments of God 
and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. Now the first character that we should identify is this male child. Now anytime you see uh, such a, a, a phrase, a word, child, you see something like that capitalized, that should give you a clue right from, from the beginning as to its identity. Now we know this child was born in what John describes as labor and pain, which spoke of a, of a, of a time of great trouble for his mother. We also know he was hated by the dragon, the child, who we're told wanted to devour him the very moment that he was born. Additionally, we're told that the child is destined to rule all nations with a rod of iron and that he was caught up from this earth to God where he was given a position of prominence at, at his throne. Now, <laughs> I don't want to spend any more time than I need to stating the obvious. Clearly, the male child, capital C, child, is Jesus, who perfectly fits uh, John's description. So with that in mind, the child being Jesus, let, let's identify the woman. Who is the woman in the text? Now, establishing kind of a complete mosaic of what we know about her from the chapter. In verse 2, John tells us that she was with child, and that the labor of this child was very difficult. In verse 5, we're told that the moment came when she eventually did uh, bear a male child, again being Jesus, whom the dragon wanted to devour. All that is being presented for us, please note, in the past tense. This is something that's already happened. Now, in a future scenario, dealing with the woman, recorded in verse 13, we're told that she, the woman, is then persecuted by the dragon, which explains why in verse 6 she's forced to flee into the wilderness for a period of 1,260 days. In fact, verse 16 tells us that she'll be supernaturally protected from the evil intents of the dragon. And because of that development, verse 17 then indicates the dragon will instead wage a war with the rest of her offspring who have the testimony of Jesus. Now regarding her identity, the identity of the woman, with all of that in mind, we can definitively say that the woman isn't Mary. Now, while Mary is obviously the, the literal mother of Jesus, the simple truth is that Mary, her story, it doesn't really fit within the complete mosaic, the complete description, especially the portion um, of this text that still addresses the woman in a future tense. It just doesn't make sense for it to be Mary. Uh, additionally, it doesn't make any sense to view this woman as being the church, really for a few reasons. Note that the church, the church didn't give birth to Jesus. In fact, it was Jesus who gave birth to the church. We've been born again. Aside from that, in 2 Corinthians 11 verse 2, Paul writes, he says, for I am I am jealous for you with a godly jealousy, for I have betrothed you, speaking of the church, to one husband, that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. Again, this woman uh, bears a child and has more offspring. It doesn't present uh, the woman in this as being a, a chaste virgin. Again, not Mary, not the church. Consistent with kind of Old Testament imagery. A better fit, probably the best fit, the accurate fit for the identity of this woman would be that she is the Jewish people or the nation of Israel. Not only was Jesus born through the nation of Israel during a time of, of great labor and pain. Again, Israel, at the time of Jesus' birth, was under Roman occupation. Uh, but the description of her as being clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, and on her head a garland of 12 stars, the reason we can say this is the nation of Israel is that that description of the woman is identical uh, to Joseph's dream of the family of, of Jacob, or Israel, uh, recorded in Genesis 37. And you can read uh, Joseph's dream and connect the dots. So we know the child's Jesus, and we know the, the woman is Israel. Now concerning the identity of the dragon... We really don't have any need to speculate. The reason is that in verse 9, John tells us very plainly who the dragon is. 
we're told that the dragon is that serpent of old called the devil and Satan. Now what makes this chapter so unique and interesting is that it provides for us the most complete profile of Satan anywhere else in Scripture. For starters, we're told that he's fiery red. Now, that doesn't mean that that Satan is red in color. Again, this is all figurative language. It's, It's articulating something about his character, his person, describing him as a fiery red dragon. He has a thirst for blood. This idea of him having seven heads with seven diadems on each, along with ten horns, it tells us that Satan is he's cunning, he's powerful, he's majestic. Which is why, again, we're told that he was able to deceive the whole world. Beyond this, the, the reference of Satan being that serpent of old, again, loaded Old Testament verbiage, tells us that Satan was the one that actually originally tempted Eve and that it wasn't an actual snake in the garden. That when we read of the serpent tempting Eve, that it's actually, it's Satan, it's Lucifer, this fallen majestic angel. Genesis 3, we're actually told that the serpent was more cunning than any of the beasts of the field which the Lord God had made. And it fits within the description here. Not only did Satan lead mankind into sin, But as an angelic being, we're told in our text that in his rebellion, he drew a third of the stars of heaven, throwing them to the earth. Now, if you're curious or perplexed about what the stars of heaven are, well, verse 9 kind of adds a bit of a definition because we're told that his angels were cast out with him. And so the stars of heaven, a third of them, uh, referring to Uh, the angelic hosts that join Lucifer in his rebellion of God. In his cursing of Satan back in Genesis 3, verse 15, we read, So the Lord God said to the serpent, I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your seed and her seed. He, speaking of the seed of the woman, shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. This messianic uh, promise that God would provide a Savior, it kind of explains why Satan then would stand before the woman who was ready to give birth. To do what? Well, to devour her child as soon as it was born because Satan knew of this prophecy. He knew that a, a Redeemer would be provided. Apparently, King Herod was not just an evil man, but his actions were motivated by Satan himself. Satanic motivation behind his desire to kill Jesus following the the, the wise men and their arrival looking for the newborn king. Now the two things that are absolutely clear concerning Satan. The two things we know about Satan from Revelation 12 is that he absolutely hates Jesus. <laughs> it's obvious. And he despises the Hebrew people, the woman. You know, anti-Semitism is, is a very real thing. It's evil. But understand, anti-Semitic actions are motivated by the depths of hell. It's motivated by Satan. Like whether it be the, the, the Nazis of the past or the fanatical Islamists of today. Like it transcends all reason and logic that such a small group of people would draw such a vitriolic hatred from so many throughout the centuries. Why are the Jewish people hated so much? Well, Satan hates them. Additionally, verse 10 provides us an insight and to Satan's current activity. Not only does Satan presently have access to the throne room of heaven, this is confirmed in in the first few chapters of the book of Job, access that we'll see will be taken away, but Satan having access to the throne room of heaven, why? What's he doing? Why is he there? Well, we're told he's actually called the accuser of the brethren. Like, understand, right, this very moment, 
and the throne room of heaven, there is Satan. And, and he's busying himself both day and night, hurling accusations about you and I before the Lord. The, the word accuser, it's a, it's a legal term. Uh, better seen as a prosecutor. He's prosecuting a case against us. And yet we have Jesus, our high priest and mediator, who defends us. Now like Satan, regarding these characters, the child is Jesus, the woman is Israel, the dragon is Satan. There's really not a, a need to speculate about who Michael is. We're actually given his name, Michael, the archangel. We know actually quite a bit about Michael from, from other passages in Scripture. In his epistle, Jude is the one that tells us that Michael was an archangel, making him the most powerful of the angelic host. A great example of his power can be found in a, an interesting story recorded for us in Daniel chapter 10. Aside from that chapter, Daniel 12 seems to indicate that Michael, as an archangel, was probably charged by God with the specific task of protecting and ministering to the nation of Israel. That he's kind of the, the defender of of the Hebrew people. Now, while there's no mystery as to his identity, the introduction of Michael in verse 7, following the record in verse 6 of the woman fleeing into the wilderness, where she has a place prepared by God that they should feed her there 1,260 days, that's significant. It's very significant. Again, as a reminder, there are portions of this chapter where John describes events that have happened in order to set the context for events that will take place. In verse 7, we read that there is a moment in time, again in the future, when a war will break out in heaven. We're told in the description of this war that Michael, and his angels, fight the dragon and his angels, Satan and his angels. Not only in, in this battle royale will Satan and his angelic cohort not prevail, so they will fail, but we're told a place would not be found for them in heaven any longer. According to verse 9, what results will be that the great dragon and his angels, they're cast to the earth. And then in verse 13, we're told that when the dragon saw that he had been cast to the earth, he persecutes the woman. Now, when thinking through the timing of what John is recording, please note that the Bible describes for us four what you might call falls from heaven, four falls of, of Lucifer, four times that Satan falls. Now, when the whole story is finished, we know that Satan's final destiny, his last fall, so to speak, will be when he's cast into the lake of fire, hell. He leads one final rebellion after spending a thousand years bound in the bottomless pit. That was another fall. Aside from that, we know that Satan initially fell from glory in his rebellion. He rebelled against God. However, in that first fall, the Bible is clear that Satan maintains access to heaven. So we have this initial fall where Satan leads a rebellion against God. There are repercussions, one of them not, his access to heaven being stripped. In the end, he'll be placed in the bottomless pit. And after a thousand years, he'll end up in hell. But between all of this, it would seem in this chapter that John is describing a future fall, a fourth one, whereby Satan has his current access to heaven revoked. That, that's what's being described in this passage. There's a war that breaks out. What results from the war? The dragon and his angels no longer have access to heaven. They're restricted to earth. Now, as you can imagine, Satan doesn't go quietly. There's this battle in the heavenly realm. He's cast to the earth. In response to that unwelcome development, Satan turns his attention to persecuting the woman. Again, we know the woman's the nation of Israel. You know, in response to this satanic persecution aimed at the Jewish people during the tribulational period, verse 14 tells us the woman, Israel, 
So this battle happens. Michael kicks Satan out of heaven. As a result, Satan's now ticked off at the woman. So there's this persecution. He persecutes the woman. The woman, Israel, we're told, verse 14, is given two wings of a gray eagle, which implies a swift movement, an escape, that she might fly into the wilderness to her place. And if you're curious what the place is, in verse 6 we're told that this was a place prepared by God. And it's in this place she's fed, and then we're told back in verse 14, and is nourished for a time, times, and half a time, three and a half years, again also told 1,260 days from the presence of the serpent. Now, what place could this be? A clue might be found in Isaiah chapter 16. Beginning with verse 3, I'll read it for you. We're told, take counsel, execute judgment. Make your shadow like the night in the middle of the day. Hide the outcasts. Do not betray him who escapes. Let my outcasts dwell with you, O Moab, which is present-day Jordan. Be a shelter to to them from the face of the spoiler for the extortioner is at an end devastation ceases the oppressors are consumed out of the land i I believe that this place prepared by god where the jewish people will seek refuge uh, and shelter from the persecution of satan uh, will be the rock city of petra again it is in the wilderness it is an old edomite capital Uh, it's in jordan now while the jewish people will be able to flee. And their escape will be successful. John does describe a very interesting scene. Look again at verse 15. He says, as the woman was fleeing, that the serpent, again being Satan, spewed water out of his mouth like a flood (coughs) after the woman, that he might cause her to be carried away by the flood. Now this satanic attack, satanically motivated assault on the Hebrew people that are trying to escape. It could be a a literal flood. Somehow Satan controlling the weather seeks to to flood out uh, the people, causing them to drown. Maybe that's the case. Um, Probably more accurately that what's being described here is an army sent out to prevent the Hebrew people from escaping, succeeding, reaching this place. Then, we're told in in a scenario that kind of comes right out of the pages of the Old Testament, John says that against incredible odds, so this army or this flood is coming after the people, and what happens? The earth intercedes and helps the woman. How? By opening its mouth and swallowing up the flood, which the dragon had spewed out of his mouth. Again, the earth might have opened up, and the flood of water is diverted, or if it's an army that the earth opens up and swallows the army whole. And if you're like, that's kind of trippy, there's precedent. (laughs) I refer you to number 16 for the precedent of such an event being possible. Now, upset by that development, the chapter closes with Satan being so enraged at the Jewish people. Again, there's a group that that has fled that he can't touch, that are protected. But we're told he goes and he makes war with the rest of her offspring. Which is another set of characters here. John defines her offspring. Not in ethnic terms. He describes the offspring of the woman at this juncture as being anyone who, quote, keeps the commands of God and has the testimony of Jesus Christ. This final set of characters that John calls her offspring simply refers to any Jew or Gentile follower of Jesus who was unable to get to this place of protection. And tragically, for these believers, they're left in a vulnerable place. They're going to have to face this very serious and concentrated ire of Satan working through the the beast, which we'll be introduced to next Sunday, the Antichrist, for a period of three and a half years. It would be serious persecution. In verse 12, John records the warning of heaven, the warning that heaven has for earth. They say, woe to the inhabitants of earth and the sea, for the devil has come down to you, having great wrath, because he knows that he has a short time. 
Again, Satan knows when his access to heaven is revoked that his time is short and the earth will draw his wrath. Now, concerning the timing of the event that John is describing for us here in Revelation 12, within the context of the seven years, Daniel's 70th week, in Matthew chapter 24, beginning with verse 15, Jesus says something interesting. He says, he says, therefore, when you see, so when you see the abomination of desolation, you're like, well, what's that? Jesus then says, spoken of by Daniel the prophet. So this abomination of desolation, standing in the holy place, whoever reads, let him understand. Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Now, if you put all these things together, it appears that at the three and a half year mark, of the very middle of the seven-year tribulational period, motivated by Satan himself, the Antichrist, will enter the temple, a rebuilt temple, and he will declare himself to be God. It's what this abomination of desolation is. In the context of Revelation 11, it's also likely that he proceeds to kill the two witnesses demonstrating his divine power. Again, these two witnesses were only allowed to minister for three and a half years, so the timing seems consistent. He kills the two witnesses. He goes into the temple. He declares himself to be God. And appalled by these actions, what they're witnessing, the Jewish people, not only do they see this man, the son of perdition for who he is, the Antichrist, but they recognize the error of their ways, that Jesus is the Christ. And they flee. Again, as Jesus said, when you see the abomination of desolation, you need to get out of town in a hurry. They flee into the wilderness, as described in this chapter. They get to this place prepared by God, and for the next 1,260 days, or three and a half years, they will be protected and find refuge from the vengeance of the Antichrist and Satan. Those that weren't able to make it to this place are in trouble. Now, before we wrap up our time together, in the very middle of this chapter, following Satan's removal from the heavenly space by Michael, John tells us, and again, look at it, beginning with verse 10. He says, Then I heard a loud voice in heaven. Again, we don't know whose voice this is. But the voice said, Now salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ have come for the accuser of the brethren. Who accused the brethren before our God day and night has been cast down. And they, speaking of the brethren, overcame him, Satan, overcame him by the blood of the Lamb, by the word of their testimony, and they did not love their lives to the death. Therefore rejoice, O heavens, and you who dwell in them. Now the reason I want to conclude with these verses in particular is that in this future scene, whereby Satan is no longer allowed to accuse the brethren, we are provided a present insight into how we, the brethren, overcome the enemy. In fact, verse 11 provides three keys by which you and I are overcomers. One, they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb. Two, they overcame him by the word of their testimony. Three, they overcame him because they did not love their lives to the death. Uh, understand that you are always left vulnerable to defeat the opposite of overcoming. If you haven't come to the point, the juncture, the moment, when you see your life and you see death for what they really are, if you don't see death and your life accurately, Defeat is very possible. It's hard to be an overcomer. You know, in Jesus, friend, you have been given not just a life today, life in that more abundantly, but you have been given what's called everlasting life. It's eternal life. And because you've been given everlasting life, it can never be taken. It's a life that I begin now and will last for all of eternity, meaning if you understand that, death has no power. Death can't take away an everlasting life. You see, the true overcomer is the person 
who does not love their life to the death. Life and death are placed into a healthy context. Now the question that we need to address is how does a person come to such a place? Like how do you come to the place where you see death and your life in its healthy context? The answer is actually found in the progression of these three keys in our text. Like the first step is the moment you realize that there is nothing else that matters in this world other than the blood of the Lamb. Like your works don't matter. Your piety doesn't matter. You being a good person doesn't matter. It's not how you're granted everlasting life. It's a gift given to you by the blood of the Lamb. You know, in 1 John chapter 1, verse uh, 7, we're told that it is only by the blood of Jesus Christ that anyone can be cleansed from sin. According to Colossians 1, verse 14, like we only have redemption and the forgiveness of sins. How? Through His blood. Through His sacrifice. Secondly, when you come to the point where you fully realize that what you've done, are doing, or will do, matters not, and the grand context of what Jesus has done, is doing, and will accomplish in your life? It's at that point that the word of your testimony can finally echo what Paul would write in Galatians 2 verse 20. Paul says, I have been crucified with Christ. His testimony. It's no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. The life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. So you need to recognize that it's it's the blood. That's the only thing that matters. And then you make that your testimony. You know, in the end, it is only a testimony that hails the work of Jesus that enables a person to have such a perspective that life and death are placed into context. Like, Paul could write an amazing statement in Philippians 1. He says, for to me, to live is Christ and to die is gain. My life is about Christ, and in death I'm given more of what I was living for, which was Christ. It's an amazing statement. Again, life and death in context. That's his testimony. That's how he's an overcomer. You see, like Paul, you are only able to overcome, to be an overcomer. You're only able to live victoriously when you understand that centering your very existence, your life around Jesus, if you do that, you know what happens? It transitions death from being a moment of loss to a moment you receive more of what you were always living for in the first place. It's interesting. that This is what Paul meant when he wrote in 1 Corinthians 15. He says, death gets swallowed up in victory. There is an accuser of the brethren. But we are overcomers. Not because we've earned it or deserve it or merit it, warrant it. We are overcomers. Because of the blood of the Lamb and the fact we've made that our testimony. And because that's our testimony, death can do nothing. My life is about Christ. Death robs nothing from me. It's not a moment of loss, but a a moment of, of transition, of glory, an overcomer. So, Father, Lord, we thank you for your word and this chapter and what it says to us. We love you. We're so thankful that your son Jesus is in heaven. And when Satan accuses us and points out our shortcomings and misgivings, that, that Jesus is there, the lamb that was slain. When Satan accuses, Jesus steps up and says it's been paid for in full. It is finished. Lord, we love you. In Jesus' name, amen.